Hey, welcome to this video. What I'm going to discuss with you today is an overview of some software called BirdNet Pi. I've been running the software on a small Raspberry Pi computer uh, for a few months now at my home in the desert in Southern California. And I've been fascinated by how many more species of birds it's identified than I was able to personally identify just from being in my backyard. Once it identified those birds, though, that clued me in to look a lot closer to what I did see in my backyard. I've had bird feeders out, you know, put bird seed out, that kind of thing. And it, in fact, as I started paying a little bit more attention with the awareness that there were more than one species of finch, for example, uh, I started to be able to discern the differences between them and, and notice them with my own eyes. And so that's a really cool uh, facet of it, but that's not the focus of it. Uh, this video today is how to identify these different birds, but just rather what the software does, and, and maybe you'd be interested in running it yourself. It, it is free software. It's open source. Um, it does have a, a non-commercial license, so it's not something that you could fold into, say, a commercialized product, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of value um, in a non-commercial sense. As a hobby, a uh, hobbyist birder, I've found it to be uh, really enjoyable to use. So let's dive into an overview of it. I've got open here the, the landing page or the home page, and it's just running on my local network here. I don't have any special security setup or anything like that. It doesn't have, um, you know, HTTPS certificates and that kind of thing. So be aware of that if you're going to run it, that it's not uh, the most secure software in the world. I don't have it exposed outside of my local network, and so it's not a problem for me. Um, but you you do want to be aware of that. And it, it runs uh, on the Raspberry Pi uh, set of computers, particularly the newer ones. I think it's a Model 3 and newer. I don't recommend running it on a 3. I'd only run it on a uh, RPi 4 or newer, depending on when you're watching this video. But right away at the, the homepage here, you see a couple things. You've got the top menu, and then you've got this nice graph of the top 10 um, species that it's detected, or birds it's detected uh, today. Over here on the left, you've got um, a running tally of the total detections it's made. So it says 1,896. This has only been running for maybe about a week where I am right now. And today it says it's, it's detected 183 individual uh, birds. That's not necessarily separate birds from one another. It's probably often the same bird over and over again, but um, that is an interesting thing to see how many detections it actually gets. In the last hour, it's detected 12. This is actually running live as I'm recording this. And today it says it's detected 10 separate species, so individual species. And then total time it's been, this installation has been running, has uh, 44 species. Now, a really cool factor about this software is that it has a lot of integrations. I'll open up... Um, I'll open up the actual home page for it um, online and just show you here on this page some of the different uh, software that it uses. So it uses a Caddy web server, which is very customizable. The, the data is being stored in a uh, SQLite database. And then it's also got the system called AppRise um, or Apprise, depending on how you pronounce it, um, which is a notification uh, piece of software that you can notify all sorts of different systems when detections are made. So that's a really cool thing that actually my brother and I, um, with the help of, uh, of some artificial intelligence, uh, enhanced a little bit and created a custom integration with a live streaming graphics uh, software called H2R Graphics, which I'll cover in another video. Um, it does a live audio stream of what it's hearing through the microphone. And then it can even integrate with this awesome website called birdweather.com, which I'll go more into in another video. But jumping back over here to my installation of it, this most recent detection that it's showing me is saying it's a monk parakeet. Um, it's got the scientific name here, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, but it's something that you know is of relevance to a lot of people. And then it automatically pulls in this picture because I've gone ahead and uh, requested a Flickr uh, API key and added that to my installation. It can search Flickr for the name of this bird and then show it to me. Now, it's not always going to be 100% accurate, but they did a really good job on the filtering of that Flickr API search, and I haven't uh, seen it to be inaccurate with what it, it detects. If you did get a wrong image, though, you could tell it never show this one again just to help it get uh, better as it ran. But that's really cool to be able to see a picture of what it heard so that I myself now, as I look out into the yard and in the area I am running it, I can keep an eye out 
uh, for this visual of this bird and be able to log it myself as something I've seen. Go and close that. It also shows you a spectrogram of this detection. It tells you the confidence level it has of its detection. And you can even play the audio that it used to detect that. So it saves that for you, gives you both the, the spectrogram visual of that, and then it also uh, has the, the WAV file um, for you to be able to play back. Then beneath that, it shows you the five most recent detections. A lot of times, these are all the same because there's a bird in the area and it's detecting it over and over and over again. But sometimes you'll get quite a mix, especially in the morning, of what it's seen. It's, it's interesting to note that the confidence level on some of these is different. Um, and so as you dive into those recordings, sometimes you can hear it a lot more clearly and that is what part of what helped it boost its confidence, no doubt. Then at the very bottom, it's got a live spectrogram of what it's actually hearing and analyzing. So that's just the home page. It also has this feature where you can click up here and you can play the live audio um, that it's, it's listening to as well. Another cool thing about this is it actually works great on a mobile device. So even if you're just wandering around your house and you have it running, you can just pull it up if you're connected to your local Wi-Fi um, and have it set up that way. You can pull up the website. It works great on there to be able to see some of the more recent detections. So it's detected a great kiskity, uh, you know, really cool sounding stuff like Ferginus uh, pygmy owl, um, other birds that I'm not very good at pronouncing the name of, uh, rufus-backed robin, clay-colored thrush, uh, for someone that loves birds, this is a really exciting thing to be running locally uh, in my own little area here and being able to see what, what is around or hear what's around. You can go into these other pages, though, that it has set up, which is pretty cool. So this is today's detections, and then you could search. So like I mentioned that owl. And you can search through the detections that it's had for the day because, you know, maybe it gets quite high, the number of them, and you don't see them in the top 10 there. Um, but this is the owl that it detected. And when I go back to the overview, you look at when it was detecting this owl. Okay, so that's the 1 a.m. hour. And it detected it 34 times, but then it, it didn't detect it anymore after that. So it must have left the area. But for that one hour, uh, it was making a number of calls that uh, the system could hear. It's got this other page here where you get a, kind of a full page spectrogram. And as you see over here, it's a little bit faint. But that's coming in, and as a bird call, you know, would call and it would hear it, you'll be able to see the, the representation of that up higher on the, on the spectrogram. You can adjust the gain there, you can turn on compression, that kind of thing. Then it's got this other great thing of the best recordings. Now, I haven't tweaked this at all. I think you can get quite um, detailed in the way you have it judge what is a good or best recording. But historically, you know, it has these recordings here, and then it has even more photos from Flickr when you dive into these. Um, below to help you get get an idea of what this bird actually looks like. That has been so helpful for me because I'm not I've not been bird watching for very long, and it's helped me just have a visual in my mind of a bird I'm looking for and be able to correlate the two things, which makes it a lot more enjoyable to bird watch because I don't I don't feel like I'm missing out on oh what is that I don't have time to kind of watch it and see how it behaves as well as look it up um, on my phone. So in the tools section. You can do all sorts of stuff. So you can exclude species, you can load in custom species, um, you can do different, uh, little more technical things like database maintenance and um, put different files on it. In a later video, I'll cover how we created a plugin for the, that apprise notification system and the file manager was really helpful for loading uh, those plugin files on, on here. It's cool, you can also go into the system controls and you see here I've got some updates waiting. So as the software um, gets updated on GitHub, this can, you hit this update button, it'll automatically pull down the most recent um, master uh, from the repo, and then you have the latest version running. You can also do a reboot, you can shut down, you can clear all the data out of it if you wanted to restart your, your database uh, clean. And then going back into tools, you also have these different settings. So I'll go through a few of them here. One of them is you can change the model. So it's got two models available right now, and there's some information here giving you specifics as to where or when you might want to use uh, one, of the, one of the different models. You can see my long, latitude and longitude there. Now, I put that in there manually. It doesn't automatically pull the exact right coordinates. Um, you can also change the name of it. I just have mine as BirdNet, but you could put something more custom there. 
And then if you want to have it publish the listings, or the, rather the detections, to that cool website, birdweather.com, all you have to do is just email um, Tim, who runs that, and he'll be able to give you uh, an ID to, to use, and then you'll have a, a little station running on that bird weather map, which is really cool to see. I don't have any of these apprise uh, notifications set up in a custom way right now. Um, this is kind of a new installation that I'm I'm using in uh, Central Mexico, and it's only because it's only been running for about a week, and I have I just haven't gotten to the point where I've added more custom notifications. But as you can see, it works with email, it works with Twitter, it works with Discord, uh, and many many other things that the apprise notification system itself supports, and that system supports plugins. So you can write your own custom plugin to notify whatever system really that you want um, over uh, HTTP um, or HTTPS. And you can customize what the notifications actually look like here. It's got a number of variables, scientific name, common name, the confidence score could be included, a link to the listening uh, URL. You know, if you were publishing this maybe in a more public way and you want to have a link to be able to go back and listen to it. Um, Really, really cool customization, uh, in my opinion. You can also send test notifications. That's a handy thing to be able to test whatever custom thing you're setting up. Here's where you put in the Flickr API key. Once you have that Flickr API key, that's when it can start pulling in those pictures automatically for you uh, from the Flickr API, uh, which is really cool. Like I said, I'm in Central Mexico, so I've got my time zone set there. You can go even further into the advanced settings here, and there's even more to be able to adjust one thing that is probably of interest to a lot of people is this privacy threshold. So if it hears what it believes to be a human, you can have it not uh, publish that audio to, like, say, bird weather, for example. And you can adjust the sensitivity of that. You can adjust whether or not it purges all the data when it's full or it keeps it. Um, if you have more than one audio card available, you can adjust which one it's, it's using there as well as the audio channels. There's a number of other things like the RTSP stream. So if you had an RTSP stream, say from like a live bird cam somewhere else and it had audio on it, or it could just be audio as well, but a lot of times it would be coming from like a, a live streaming camera setup. You could uh, put that in here and it could pull that in as the audio rather than, you know, a microphone plugged directly into the Raspberry Pi. You can also tweak the recording length and the extraction length. So the extraction length I have set is 15 seconds. The recording length for each clip is 30 seconds. And so within that 30 seconds, you know, it'll pull out the 15 second clips that are the detection. And you can even change the, the format here of the audio that it's saving it in. If you want to set a password to make it a little bit more secure, you can. Um, and you can also hook up some stuff for custom URL if you were going to make it more publicly available. I haven't messed with these BirdNet light settings in terms of its detection sensitivity. Um, that's quite a bit more technical, and I just haven't learned enough about that to feel confident I'm, I'm going to be able to enhance what I'm, the results I'm getting. But um, don't be afraid of it. It's just something I haven't got, gotten to yet. But that's pretty much it. I'll jump back over here to the overview. And yeah, I just wanted to show that to you. I think it's really cool. And like I said, I was able to build... Um, my brother and I were able to build uh, an integration with a live a graphic system, which I'll dive into later. And what was cool about that is while I was live streaming some bird feeders, as it did the detection, I could get a graphic to pop up and, and say, you know, this bird was recently detected. So it gives a little bit more of an educational slash interactive feel to the live stream. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.